So, Neil, I want to start there a little bit, because what struck me is that if you look at these cases, from the New York criminal case to Georgia to special counsel Jack Smith's dual case, they all have this one common thing, and one thing in common, fraud. And I was struck, of course, as I just played, by a the AG's comments, which, again, could be applied anywhere. But if you're a prosecutor, how do you look at kind of this theme of grifting and fraud over the course of decades and in multiple cases? Yeah, so first I just wanted to make a comment about what Don Jr. said, equivocating these judgments to what happens in Russia. No, yeah. in Russia they literally execute political opponents. The Trumps can't even condemn that. And indeed, Trump is coming into court trying to seek absolute immunity so that he as president could, as he said, uh, allow the execution of his political opponents. Mm. And so to me, the theme, Jen, is not just fraud, which is a common theme throughout all of these different cases, but also this idea of impunity, that he is above yeah. the law. He goes into court. He's been saying this even before he became president in 2016. He committed various crimes. He said, well, you couldn't prosecute me because I'm now sitting president and in office. And then when he's impeached, says, you know, you have to prosecute me. You can't just impeach me. And then when he leaves his office as president, he says, well, you can't president, you can't prosecute me because you didn't fully impeach me. I mean, the whole thing is just a house of cards. At every turn, it's about saying, I, Donald Trump, am above the law. And that's why this decision, I think, was so important this week by Judge Egmeron, mm -hmm. because it attacks one of the things Trump is most proud of, his supposed business acumen. And so the judgment's not just a blow to his business and to his wallet, it's a blow to his ego, and it's a blow to his claim that he's above the law. And such a good point on Putin. Trump has an affinity for Putin. I, this has been on my mind, and I'm going to be talking about it later in the show. Andrew, let me, let me go to you here, because there's a lot of practical questions here. Uh, you know, obviously, Trump now owes a lot of money, I think it's fair to say. He has, if I understand it correctly, but you'll correct me if I'm in, misstating, 30 days about. So what happens in that time period it, when, when he gets to 30 days? If he appeals, what percentage does he have to pay? Basically, what does it look like over the next couple of weeks? Sure. Um, so there is a about three hundred and fifty million dollar judgment. As you said, there's also interest. That's about another hundred million. He also owes about 90 million to E. Jean Carroll for sexual assault and repeated defamation. So we're now actually talking about some real money for anybody. Um, so add that all up. And what mm -hmm. he has to do is he gets to appeal both the federal E. Jean Carroll case for that's about 90 million. He gets to appeal, um, which is part of our process, the um, judgment that just came out on Friday. However, what is required is in 30 days of the Judge and Gorin decision, he has to either pay the money or he has to the post total. a bond. Yeah, the total. And so that is going to be difficult because he has loans outstanding to, like, for instance, Deutsche Bank. When you take a loan out in his situation, he gave a personal guarantee. There are liens on his property. Mm -hmm. um, there usually are commitments he has to make in terms of cash reserves. So, in other words, there's a lot of encumbered assets. So he needs to either figure out how he's going to pay that or find a bond company that's willing for a fee to put the money up. And the reason, by the way, is clear. It's like this is the court saying, you know, if you want to appeal, that's fine, but we need to protect the plaintiffs because mm -hmm. while you're appealing, there has to be a pool of money available to them. And then one just quick comment um, is the, EG, the sort of decisions that have come down are quite interesting because you have somebody who's saying, trust me to run the country mm -hmm. for four years. But you have Judge Ngoran, as you've said, Jen, saying, I don't trust you to run your own company in New York for three years, and I'm going to require two independent monitors to oversee you. And this right. is the same person who's saying, trust me to run the country. Can't think of anyone better to talk to than someone who sat face to face with Vladimir Putin himself on behalf of Trump himself. Joining me now is Donald Trump's former national security advisor, Ambassador John Bolton. So we, we were just talking about this during the break. I mean, this has been quite a week. You know, you start with Trump saying that he, Russia can do whatever they want as it relates to NATO countries. It continued with a complete standstill on aid to Ukraine, something they desperately need, given the progress Russia's made even over the weekend. It ended, of course, with the death of Alexei Navalny. And you've sat in a lot of these rooms, many of them. I just want to ask you sort of how does Putin, how does 
he consume what's happening here in the United States, Trump's words or lack of words, I should say, in some cases? Well, I think he sees things moving in his direction. And uh, he, he really uh, outdid himself in terms of disinformation a couple of days ago by a reporter asked, well, what do you think of Biden versus Trump? And he said, well, Biden's predictable and so on, I implying he was endorsing what did you Biden. make of that when you heard that? It, it's a it's a clear disinformation effort. To, so to confuse give, people to give Trump the opportunity, which he was foolish enough to take, to say, "Well, I thought that was actually a compliment to me." I mean, uh, if uh, if if Trump is elected, uh, there'll be celebrations in the Kremlin. There's no doubt about it because Putin thinks that he is an easy mark. Easy, easy to manipulate. I mean, this week there was also some pretty big news about Trump having to pay now. I mean, it's four hundred fifty million dollars from just this week. Um, with interest. You're familiar with how foreign capitals think about these things. Are you worried about Trump having all of these, this money he owes and being a target in that way of people like Putin and other foreign authoritarian or autocrats? Well, I think it's going to result in him having to liquidate some of his properties. I don't see where he's going to get the cash, although it's not really a near term problem. He'll appeal. He'll have to post a bond, of course. But uh, I, I think these are the things that really affect him uh, most immediately because this is his money. And let's face it, what Donald Trump cares about most of all is Donald Trump and particularly Donald Trump's money. But could foreign autocrats, I mean, they look and they target. You said he's a he's a good target. Could they look at him and think, ah, he's a good target. He owes tons of money. He's got to liquidate assets. He may not even have it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think this is one of the demonstrations why Trump really is not fit for office. He's he is consumed by these troubles. His family is consumed by them. And I think foreigners will try to take advantage of it one way or another. They, they may be doing it already. Uh, let me ask you just about Navalny, because Alexei Navalny is, uh, of course, a very prominent opposition leader. He has bravely been in jail. He spent 300 plus days in, in sort of almost an isolated, freezing cold cell. Democrats and Republicans, not enough Republicans, I will say, have spoken out. Nikki Haley has. Trump has been completely silent. He had a two hour speech yesterday, he said nothing. What do you make of that? Well, heaven forbid he say anything critical of Vladimir Putin. Look, accidents don't happen in those kinds of Russian prison camps. Uh, when Navalny's mother asked to uh, take care of the body, uh, they refused to give it to her and they told her that Cause they wanted to have an autopsy. They told her the cause of death was sudden death syndrome. Well, I, I'd sure like to know what that is. Maybe it means you're alive one minute and dead the next. I don't know what else it can mean. But, you know, uh, four years ago, when Navalny was uh, the victim of an attempted assassination by poisoning, uh, other people immediately condemned what was obviously the Kremlin's weapon of choice against its opponents, poisoning. Trump didn't comment on it, said he didn't have information uh, to, to, to judge. I mean, he's only the president of the United States at that point. So it's obviously part of a pattern. He simply doesn't want to criticize his friend Putin, because in Trump's mind, if he's got a good relationship with Putin, the U.S. has a good relationship with Russia. This is the kind of thing that, that uh, tells Putin that Trump simply doesn't know what he's doing. There has also been alarming news this week about Putin's reported efforts to put a nuclear weapon in space to target American satellites. There's not a ton we know about it exactly, but it, it did make some news this week. The ban on nuclear weapons in space was among the topics uh, that Putin said was on his agenda to discuss with Trump back in Helsinki. Now, that was in 2018. You were the national security advisor at the time. Trump did a lot of that one on one. But was it a topic that came up or was discussed in any way? No, I don't believe so. You know, it's it, they say it's one on one, but there are always two interpreters, one for yeah. each side. And I will say that my staff immediately after the one on one ended, went to the U.S. interpreter and said, what did they talk about? Most of it was about Syria mm. uh, and Putin did most of the talking. So I consider that a victory. The less time Trump is actually saying anything to Vladimir Putin, that's a good thing. Nothing came out of it. We had a lunch uh, right after it, and uh, I'm, I'm confident nothing sensitive was discussed. There's no question you've talked about this a fair amount, and I'm even familiar with this from my time in the national security world. Every country's watching what's happening globally. And I wanted to ask you about President Xi and how he is watching, say, the events of the past couple of weeks, where the dysfunction in Washington has meant that there's no funding currently moving forward and no clear path to support Ukraine. So Putin has kind of a fair 
free game there. Um, and they, they have, of course, aggression that they are considering as it relates to Taiwan and other, uh, other uh, territories in the region. How do they watch this? Do they think, oh, we're, we're safe from the U.S.? There's nothing that's going to happen here? No, they're, they're exuberant in Beijing. Remember, this aid package should include aid to Taiwan, which, uh, which can use it uh, uh, immediately if they could get their hands on it. Uh, th this is the sort of uh, navel-gazing that America sometimes gets into, which its foreign adversaries take advantage of. And in Beijing right now, they're looking at the war in Ukraine, they're looking at the uh, war in the Middle East, and they're saying to themselves, you know, the uh, Biden's attention is diverted by two wars, a difficult presidential campaign. What should we be doing to take advantage of the United States? So I'm surprised, actually, we haven't seen more trouble along China's Indo-Pacific periphery. It may come. Uh, but, you know, looking at Donald Trump, the only question in my mind, if uh, Trump is reelected, is whether the bigger celebration will be in the Kremlin or in Beijing, because they, too, see Donald Trump as an easy mark. There was a singular myth that helped launch Donald Trump's political career, a myth that lent him an air of legitimacy. Somehow, his brand of snake oil salesman separated him from other political outsiders, other conspiracy theorists, and your basic loud guy at the end of the bar running his mouth. The myth, of course, was that Donald Trump was a successful, self-made New York businessman, responsible for big buildings, big profits, and big success. I am a business person building buildings and doing things all over the world, and I'm doing things, and built a great company. I built a great company. Let me tell you, folks. I built a great company, unbelievable company. My company has never been stronger. It's never been better. It is one great company. I built a massive company, a great company. I built a phenomenal company. And if we could run our country the way I've run my company, we would have a country that you would be so proud of. There's no question. The self-made billionaire narrative is a nice story. But for anyone who actually paid attention to Donald Trump's years in business, it's clear what he actually was, and frankly still is today, a con man and a grifter who benefited enormously from his father's wealth and only stayed relevant due to his insatiable desire to be in the spotlight. For years, he slapped his name on overpriced products all over the place, Trump steaks, Trump water, and even the Trump board game. And that long-held business strategy continued yesterday when he pushed his, not making this up, official sneaker at SneakerCon. In addition to slapping his name on overpriced merchandise all over the place, it's also public knowledge that Trump stiffed contractors and refused to pay workers, that he had to pay $25 million to settle the lawsuit over his bogus Trump University grift, and that he was forced to close his own charitable foundation, charitable that is, and pay $2 million for repeatedly misusing funds for his own interests. But this week, the story of Donald Trump the fraudster got a substantial new chapter. Because on Friday, a judge ordered him to pay more than $350 million in damages, plus interest, a lot of money, and barred Trump from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for three years. And let's just say the Trump world didn't take that so well. My father built the skyline of New York City. And this is the thanks he gets? Everyone's screaming about Russia, 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 but the reality is what we complain about in Russia is happening right here in the United States. The damages and restitution should go to Donald Trump. Unless the appeals process in New York comes to the rescue, New York has become a legal banana republic. If we're not successful, New York State is gone. People are moving out of New York State. And because of this, they're going to move out at a much faster rate. Well, he didn't build the New York skyline, and I also feel fairly confident that New York State will still be around if the judgment survives Trump's appeal. But what this decision paints on Trump is that the, the truth that anyone who's been watching closely has known for decades, that Donald Trump is a fraud. That's his entire story for decades. Take a listen to something that New York Attorney General Letitia James said in her remarks on Friday. The scale and the scope of Donald Trump's fraud is staggering. And so, too, is his ego and his belief that the rules do not apply to him. Today, we are holding Donald Trump accountable. We are holding him accountable for lying, cheating, and a lack of contrition, and for flouting the rules that all of us must play by. 
A.J. James was, of course, talking about her civil fraud case against Trump and his company. But her words could have easily applied to other cases Trump is still facing, because fraud is at the core of each of them. And she's right when she says Donald Trump doesn't think he should be held accountable for his lies and actions. We've known that for a very long time. But what this new massive penalty this week hammers home is that Donald Trump has always been a fraud, and he's always been a cheat.